out of our usual perception, usual understanding, is there someone who does a sin, you fell, you made a mistake, and has God prepared a way that enables us to rectify, to come back, to back to uh, fix what you did? But we saw that he expanded the concept to beyond that, that it's not just man and after sin, but it's a, a force in nature, in all of reality. And God implanted in the world this force that pushes the world toward tikkun, towards perfection, towards elevation, to become a better world. It's, it's, one, it's like, a, we mentioned, like a spiritual force, a gravitational force that pulls to betterness, to perfection. The question is, how does that fit in the concept of the word that we saw the usage in the Torah is, is like in English, lashuv, is to return. Not just getting better and more perfected, that's nice, but how is it returning? So he said, indeed, the world, he mentioned those different stages, how the world, so to speak, began. God had an ideal in creation. Looking at the Torah and created the world, we saw that there's an ideal, there's a goal, a purpose. God has not just create the world uh, by chance, and uh, but rather with the goal in mind and initially that goal is not fully fulfilled and purposely so we saw to enable man to come and to participate in that perfection in returning the world to its perfection but the goal is now in the beginning of the manifestation of that ideal there's a lowering there's a falling we mentioned that falling from godliness this ideal to worldliness and the rest of the world all of history and where we participate in our goal and our mission in this world is to participate in bringing the world, returning the world back to that original goal. So there's three stages, we said this infinite, divine, absolute ideal. There's the world as it looks. Then we come along, we said Adam Rishon came and even furthered the world from that goal. Blocked, put in more filters and blocks between that light, that goal, and the reality, how it's revealed and seen. And then we come along and God, unfortunately, we add our, like, you know, that, even more, push the world farther. And our goal is not only that that third cycle of tshuva, like when individuals, how they sin, and we add more filters and blocks that light to the expression of that goodness, that holiness to be infused in this world. We, we do tshuva on that to return the world back to where it was before we added that sin. But even beyond that, even after that, even before we have that sin, the world is supposed to go to Adam Rishon, where he was began, and even more than that, what he was supposed to do, to bring the world to its ultimate fulfillment, actualization of that divine ideal which is beyond the limits of this world as we see it today. This is the fallen state. In other words, there's this constant force that we're participating in. We're part of something very big of a universal tikkun, tekein olam b'malchut shaday, to fix the world, to fix all of creation, to bring it back to that full actualization. What God has in store for the world is so much more than just less evil, less suffering. That's also amazing. But it's more than that, to bring the world to what God has in store, the goodness that He has in mind. It's not limited to our perspective based on the world as it is. If we asked, um, actually, there is a, if you have the source, I don't know if you have the sheets, the source number nine. You got that second sheet here, the mm -hmm. source number nine? Number nine yes, oh. Yeah, so those who don't have it, no, I have enough to give you. Just quickly, the Shla Akadosh, one of the five um, that are given the name in Jewish history, not given the name, they, that are part of their name, Am Yisrael considered like the holy. No, no, the Rakim Solota Matafazot. As the, um, there's five that are known, so to speak. Uh, with that name, that title, epithet of Haoli, right? We have Avram Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu. There's different titles that Am Yisrael ascribes to certain people. And there's five that are called holy. That again, there's a lot of holy people, holy rabbis throughout history. But one of the five, right? You, uh, you know the other four? No. Ari. Yeah, Ari Kadosh. Don't you do the homework and look for the others. Three were in Tzvat at the same time. One of them, the Ariza, Ariya Kadosh. But one of them, the Shla Kadosh. The Shla is his Rav Horowitz, or Shai Horowitz. He wrote the book called Shnei Luchot Tabrit, Shin Lamed Hei. The, the book is called on the name, the, the, how do you say, the acronym, Shin Lamed Hei, Shla Kadosh. Yudha Nasi also? Right, Kadosh, Rabbeinu Kadosh. Okay. So, you do the homework and we'll get to them. We saw the, 
in the other classes we mentioned a few others. But he meant, I'll just say quickly, since we're approaching Rosh Hashanah, this is the last class before Rosh Hashanah. So about the shofar, the mitzvah of the shofar, that he finds a hint or a teaching from the shofar itself, that same idea that we mentioned. There's the goal, there's the ideal, there's the perfected state, there's the falling into the imperfected, the breaking down, and we mentioned like you build something, you have the idea, the carpet, the architect has an idea in his mind, and then he starts building, right? The building is in Balagan, you have the nails, the hammers, the, the, the wood, it's all. And then at the end, you have the fulfillment, the actualization. There's three stages. We mentioned the ideal, the beginning of the actualization, and then the fulfillment. So too, he says, the shofar. The shofar we have, he says, on the individual level, so to speak, that God created man straight, perfect, uh, proper, right? Elokim asata adam yashar. But man comes and sometimes messes up. He doesn't live according to that yashar, that straightness, that upright, that honesty, that um, perfect moral uh, compass of direct perfection. And that's the, the first kia is the kol pashut, the straight, the simple, the straight, normal, healthy. Then there's the shvarim. The shvarim is already broken. If you mentioned the beginning of creation, there's a breaking of the vessel because this light is so great that uh, there's, there's a breaking and then the sins and man comes and messes up a little bit, little mistakes, and then there's even more. There's tua, the tu, 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 even more breaking and breaking and more totally, some would speak, uh, distancing from that original white light that perfected, that unified straight light. Now there's a breaking three, one, two, three, the shvarim, and then there's the tua, and then at the end... <laughs> What do we do? Come back to the Tkiah. He says at the end, we return to the Tuvash Lema, returning to the Tkiah Krona, is called Pashut Vyashar, the straight uh, ideal, the fulfillment of that ideal, the straight uh, blasting. I think it's a hint. The question is, though, we left off with two questions. One, why is it important to uh, this expanded view, the universal tshuva? It's enough to do tshuva. I have enough problems that I did, bad things that I did I have to fix. I'll advise that we should do that and perfect our private lives. To know that it's a universal process, all of creation, all of mankind, all of existence is rising, is perfecting, is going, and we have a hand in all that. We can. So why is that important to know? And two, we asked... The rabbis ask and others point out that there's no vidui on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment, uh, the day that God gives us to for fix ourselves and we're being written down, the books of life and etc. written, open up. And we don't do tshuva, we don't do uh, vidui. Vidui is the main part of the tshuva, right? The Rambam says the tshuva is not just, you know, the saying, I did this, I did that, is recognizing the sin and vidui, the call it, uh, confession. But in English, I'm doing the expression of uh, particular things of what I did and what I have to fix. That's the main part of tshuva. And here the rabbis say not to do. We don't have the vidu. It's not part of the prayers. You don't even mention sin. As we, how can they? How can they prevent us? I want to do tshuva. I want to make sure that I'm written in the book of life. I want to be in the righteous, etc. I want to fix. I want to change. I want to do tshuva. So that's what we left off with last week. And the, two, the answer to both questions is the same. The Vilna Gon, in the, the Sidur, there's a Sidur, the Isha Yisrael, the Vilna Gon, there's an opening, the introduction to the prayers of Rosh Hashanah. And like I said, the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, there's no mention of... Um, of, you know, I did this, I did that. Yom Kippur is full, right? There we have a lot of the, on the sins that we did and this and the listing. So the Vilna Gaon, it writes like this. Just again, summary. Uh, look and see how our rabbis enacted or wrote down the prayers for Rosh Hashanah. Only they are totally focused on the honoring of the, or for the recognition, rec- the request for the honor of the Shekhinah, of God's presence, that his name, his ideal should be revealed in the world. There's no private request. Give me this, give me life, give me a God, I, I made a mistake, help me, save me. Give. It's all for the, totally for the manifestation, that his honor 
should be revealed in the world and his kingdom that he guides in recognition of the totality of God's oneness and goodness in the world, that his name, his ideal, should be revealed in the world. What about me? What if I, there's no mention of me, so to speak. It's all of God's kingdom should be recognized and all the world should be one and unified under the kingdom of God and recognize. How, how, how can that be? We should have to gather together and stand on our souls in the day of judgment. This is the day of judgment. We are being, what did you do? How do you stand up to? How do you live up to that ideal of God? So let me do tshuva, let me, we should ask for forgiveness, mechila, and life, and, 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 and the livelihood, and children. And what is it that a rabbi said, lo laskir shum chet vavo, not to mention any sin or uh, avira, or sin on Rosh Hashanah. It should be the opposite. That usually a person admits, he confesses, he did the sin, and he fixes his ways. Then he is uh, repentant, so he is accepted, it uh, fixes his ways. And here, if we don't mention our, our sins, we don't fix it, then who's going to mention it for us? In other words, we, this is the day that it's all, this is that we're coming for the judge. But rather, he brings down from the Zohar, that this is the big day of God's kingdom. What a, a disgrace it is that you come before the king and he comes to be king over the world, to show his goal, his good in the world, to recognize that uh, he watches the world and guides the world. What is a king? That he's a melech, that he relates to every person, and there's judgment, and there's not just judgment like a cruel king, but the fact of his kingdom, that he relates to everyone, sees what everyone's doing, cares, and watches, and directs all in order to manifest that goal of creation, of that absolute good in the world. And here you are asking for... Uh, I have a problem with my uh, faucet, whatever, and other your private question. Here we're talking about the kingdom of God, the ultimate perfection of all of existence. And you start out, what an what a insult it is, Elbon, that you're asking like a, a, a dog, he says, that give me, give me, give me this, give me that, give me money, give me a livelihood, give me this. Even spiritual, give me, save my soul, whatever, life. And you're not thinking about re requesting the, the honor of God that is desecrated among the nations, that the fact that Jews are in exile, that his name cannot be revealed in the world, that the whole deal of creation is being held withheld. And you're asking about, uh, like I said, you go to the king of the universe, and you're saying, I have, like I had a problem with my plumbing, I have a problem, my stomach hurts here, whatever. The perspective, you should be and raise your, raise your sights to what it really is. It's a very, it's a disgrace to look at your private accounting when what's at stake here, what you should be focusing on is this bigger picture, like we said before, the universal picture, the expression, the actualization of the divine ideal for all. Rise up to that. How man will dare to ask on his own private self from the goods of this world? When what's at stake here is the, the greatness of all, beyond yourself, beyond the moment, beyond the, the ultimate goal of God's kingdom, God's name of goodness and holiness in the world. But takeno lama machut shadai. When do we say that? To fix the world under God's kingdom? Aleinu. Aleinu. And when do we say Aleinu in Rosh Hashanah? You know, give it the high holidays. In, in Musaf. The in the middle, the, middle, the middle of the Amudah, the Musaf prayers. Mm -hmm. Aleinu we say every day, three times a day, at the end of every prayer. To ultimately we finish, we culminate the culmination of, to rise up and high up. And you say, wow, the end of Aleinu Shabach, you summarize that God, you've made us one in order to, you know, with the kingdom, the, unit of the nation of Israel. We're not like others, we're separate, so to speak, isolationist. But the second paragraph, isolated for what? Like the heart. Isolated what? In order to bring life to all. The taken ulam. Look how many times it says all. The all of mankind, all of the flesh, everything to recognize, to fix all the world. And that prayer that we say every day is in the middle of the Musaf prayer, like the ultimate in the middle of the Musaf. The center of prayer is the Alain al Shabakh. <laughs> to recognize what, without, again, all the prayers, he says, of Rosh Hashanah are about that. The kingdom of God and let your name be known and recognized. It's not just like for God's honor, it's his kingdom, wants everyone to bow down to him. We're talking about, again, the honor of God is the manifestation of his name, of his ideal, of his good for all, for us, for all, everything, the ultimate, absolute good. But don't limit that good to the focus on now your private accounting of what's in it for me, but rather the, the absolute good, God's name, the honor of God. And therefore the rabbi said not to focus, that it's forbidden to focus on the private, that we shouldn't go after our own uh, heart's desires 
even the slicha, the chaparah for our sake, what's in it for me? But rather we put all that aside for the bigger picture, what I call it, in my words, uh, for al-hadar kvod elokeinu, for the glory of God's kingdom. In other words, again, the glory of God, the, the ideal, what I call it, that light, that goodness that he wishes to bestow. He's just waiting for, ask, fix or line up. First of all, put yourself in that perspective. What's at stake here? It's not what's in it for me. It's what's, what's in it for you, God. What we say over and over again, leman shemecha, this morning we said, right, in the, the tachanun, We've discussed that at certain times, but we have that, that whole prayer of the Tachanun this morning, right? The long Tachanun on Mondays and Thursdays. Leman Shemecha. Count how many times it says that, that theme, that central theme. Do this, save us. Uh, he say, um, forgive us. Why? Because it's, for, what about me? I'm, I'm worried about myself. No, Leman Shemecha, for your name's sake. What's at stake here is your name, your ideal. That requires also, that is revealed through me in my life. But I'm waiting, I want life for your name. Like we say also in the, what he brings down, the next line actually. We do say, we do ask for life. It says, Zochreinu l'chaim. In the beginning of the Shemona Atzrei, in the Yosh Hashanah. Remember us to life. But why? Melech hafetz v'chaim. You are the king that wants life. Not because I'm concerned about my private self, because you want life. I want to live. I want to be strong and healthy. Because that's how your name, you wish to bestow that good. And you want people to be alive. You're not some king that... Again, some other gods of other religions, idols that, you know, their competition with man. Man has to submit, less alive, less sub, just to subordinate himself. The suppression and repression of life, separation of church and state. Of, there's life and there's God and there's spirituality. It's one that two diametrically opposed. God wants life. Melech hafetz b'chaim. And what do we say? Kotvenu b'sefer chayim. Write us in the book of life. Why? What's the next words there in the prayer? Leman chay elokim chayim. For your sake. Because you desire life. But her orientation is that because your name is revealed through me in my life, etc. Not because I want life because of my private selfish concern, but for your name's sake, for your desire to fulfill your name in the world, that you wish to have life, the villain God says. Everything is based on Hadrat Kvod Elokeinu, on the honor of the Kavod, the honor of God, the name of God in the world, that you should be that you should be king over all, alone. No other forces, no other things that block that light. Let the good be revealed in its totality. All the other things don't aren't important to us. But rather your name that is desecrated amongst the nations. And that's why I said Yechesco 36, what we're concerned about is that a Jews in exile that holds up your name, the divine ideal of all of existence, depends on our presence in the land of Israel, comes through our Jewish nationhood in the land of Israel, as you have Yechesco, right? You're outside the land and you've desecrated my holy name. Right? Yechesco 36, verse 20 or something. That outside the land, why the Gerut is bad? Because we're suffering persecutions, pogroms, holocaust. Of course that's a bad. But it's not even because of that that we're concerned. The higher concern is that your name is desecrated. Your name is withheld from full expression when we're in the exile. Even if it's a luxurious exile. And we're not suffering. People come, most of you came from exiles that are they're doing okay, so to speak, physically and I think even spiritually. We have all that we need. I have that article, right, from the Los Angeles Times. There's nothing an Orthodox Jew needs that isn't here. What are we lacking? <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> Mashiach. This, we have everything. We can go to shul. We have davening. We have kosher kitchen, kosher uh, pizza, kosher, everything. But God's name, whether a luxurious or not luxurious exile, the, in the exile by itself constitutes, as we saw and we'll see more without the Shem, Constantly the desecration of God's name, the inability to the full expression of this name, this ideal, this goodness, this holiness that comes to all, not just to us, to the world. The creation comes to the fulfillment of this absolute good. That's what's at stake, and that's where you're supposed to be, as we'll see soon, the sources of it. The focus shouldn't be on the private, on the selfish, the self-centered. What's in it for me? What have I got out of it? Judaism isn't like that. Rosh Hashanah, we're expected to rise up to that. We'll see soon. But let me just finish. So that's what he said to Vilna Gon, that this is the main essence of our request, that all should know you and recognize you in order to bring about your kingdom, actualization, what I, in my words, the actualization of the divine ideal. And when we do so, with that intention, what about the question? What about us? Behoza to the books of life and now judgment. What do we say? Everything is aside, but... Uh, what is it? Suicide, we have to concern with ourselves. No, because when you have this intention, 
then certainly your sins will not be mentioned. In other words, when this, when you get to this lofty level, you're already not on a sinning level. You're not a selfish, private person that's worried about yourself. When you're on this level, that already is like a, a form of tshuva, a form of, of connection to Hashem. To the, you're worried about His ideal, and you go, oh. So the king says, oh, say, now you're, you're worried about me, you're worried about my name, that you're, that's, the, that's the tshuva. It's not like you're like you have to, you'll be, your sins will be recorded, they're not erased because you didn't do tshuva, and you're worried about God's kingdom. No, that very rising up to that level erases the sins. It gets a certain level of tshuva. Later, Yom Kippur comes, and then you remorse and regret. But why? Not out of the selfish concern. Now you're on the level that recognizes what's at stake here is this bigger goal of creation, and I'm, I'm, the remorse I have, the regret I have for these bad doings is because it holds up this greater ideal. Not because, of, again, Rav Cook explains on the same question he deals with why we don't do Vidu and Rosh Hashanah. There's a book called Midbar Shur. The lectures called Rashot uh, of Rav Cook. Uh, when he was a rabbi in, in, outside of Israel, before he came to Israel, when he was younger. And Rush, uh, how do you say, lecture, sermon number 18, he discusses this at length. And the same idea that it, if we do tshuva right away on Rosh Hashanah, the tshuva that doesn't need much preparation is the tshuva out of yira, out of fear of punishment. What's in it for me? You don't have to learn a lot. You don't have to be a high level, as you know, as a idealist. It, it hurts. I don't want to get. I don't want to get punished. Again, it requires that you believe in God, that there's a source, and that it punishes that God and watches the world. If you don't believe in it, oh, I'm doing whatever I want and nothing bothers me. But the person that believes, you understand that there's a, there's a king, there's truth, and the, uh, there's reward and punishment for living up to that truth or not. But it doesn't require any great preparation, any uh, advanced um, uh, moral betterment. It's just, again, self-concerning, wants to live uh, happily, peacefully. So if the policeman is watching and he will punish me if I do something wrong, so I'll... I regret the, I go up to the police and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. So let me off this time. So Rav Kook explains how the tshuva, if we were to do tshuva on Rosh Hashanah, it would be limited to the level of what's called tshuva miyirah, the tshuva out of fear, which means, like I said, worried about your private concern of what's in it for me. Can't shut it off. Can't shut it off. However, Hashem wants us, Hashem wants us and knows that we're prepared for a much higher level, what's called tshuva mi ahava, tshuva out of love, tshuva out of what's called an, out of the ideal, of recognizing not what's in it for me, but what can I do to help advance the goal, and I have regret if I did things against that goal, that withheld that goal. That takes a more advanced, again, spiritual level, moral level, of uh, like an idealistic person that's outside. A child is worried about himself. All he knows is the physical, the, his four cubits, the private level of his individual he wants. He take, you know, the toy you take, you're jealous. Just, I want, it's all for me. You're supposed to grow up and develop more and more that you want to help others and give to others and sacrifice for others. The, the more, the bigger, broader picture of uh, what's called, again, tshuva from Ara Ahava. That, Rav Kook says, that if we were to do tshuva on Rosh Hashanah, the usual tshuva, so to speak, you would just immediately say, oh, God, forgive me, help me, and again, out of this private concern, out of a selfish interest, uh, like I said, what's in it for me, what like the Vilna Gon says in the Zohar, says that's very not worthy, because God wants us to be, and knows that we're prepared for, and wants us to rise to the level of tshuva miyahava. He says, wait a minute, don't do tshuva, so to speak, right away. First, let me give you these two days, a gift, of preparation, the prayers, the, the customs, and the laws, and the shofar, all these things are two days as opportunity to rise up to a different level, become who you really are. It's not so easy, as we'll see soon, every day to be on this level. But here we have two days opportunity to prepare us to now put yourself aside, like the Vilna Gon, right? And now rise up to the bigger picture. Rise up to the worldly, the universal, the absolute, the divine, the man shemecha, for your name's sake. And that's what God wants, and that's what God prepares us for. And therefore, these two days, um, is if we don't do tshuva, we don't say, uh, Remor, I God, I, forgive me, whatever. 
to get up to this level of tshuva v'yahava. And then, like I said, once you get to this perspective, like I said, these prayers, like the Vilnagon of, of the God's kingdom, and you're good, let the world know, let the world recognize, let everything connect to you. Aleinu l'shabeach, that all of mankind, all of, to connect to you, to link all the branches of existence to you, to the source, to the infinite good, and let everything get this blessing. The idealist, you become totally, that's what's my concern. And now, like I said, you go back to Yom Kippur, but now you don't go back and say, now get me worried about my private things. Now, even my, my individual acts are not out of this tshuva from Yerva, are now out of the, this, like I said, the, the recognition that my private negative acts, the bad things that I did, hold up this greater good for all of mankind, all of existence. And that's what bothers me. That's a different tshuva. And then the tshuva is um, on a total different level, and that's what God wants. And our cook explains the same, like we've been going a little bit different now, how, how the fact that you didn't do vidu on Rosh Hashanah, usually it's a deficiency in the tshuva. If you can't say, I'm sorry, like a person, sometimes it's hard to say to someone else, you're sorry. You know, they tell a child, say you're sorry. Mm, say you're sorry to your brother, you hit your brother, and they'll tell him, I'm sorry. It's hard to say. You have to be really in it and whatever. So usually the lack of vidui shows a, a lack of the completion of the tshuva. You're really not convinced or totally that you did something wrong. But the reason we don't do tshuva, we don't do vidu, we don't say vidu, on Rosh Hashanah, is not because of any lack on our part, because God, the rabbi said not to. In other words, we don't do it because of the out of the honor of God that it's not worthy on this day to request and to focus on me and my private demands, to me and my private uh, accounting of what will be with me and what will be my fate and my uh, health and etc. That's not the point now. So the reason we don't do vidu is because, no, God, now I want to focus on your name, your good. So that is not a deficiency in the lack of vidui, and therefore it's not considered a, like a deficiency, and therefore you're not considered an evil person that doesn't do tshuva. It's considered that uh, God strengthens the hirhur, that you want to do tshuva. You have, you're allowed to hirhur, you're allowed to consider and thought of things about bettering yourself. You're not supposed to do the vidui, to say it vocally, so to speak. So God strengthens that inner hirhur. Usually the hirhur alone, just the thought of tshuva is not enough. But here, God says, you're not doing vidu, you're not saying it, vocalizing it because of my honor, and therefore he strengthens the hirhur, the thoughts of tshuva that you had, your intentions, and makes it, and then considers it uh, a, a good tshuva, and then on Yom Kippur, you complete the process with actually the vidu, but again, out of a total different level. And that's the level, the, again, all the prayers, and all that God wants, so to speak, that the prayer, like the Vilna said, that we're fixed that way, and not to do tshuva, so to speak, not to say vidu. Not to repent, not to, that word isn't good, repent. I don't like the word confession, right, in other associations, whatever. But not to do, not to say vidui of al-chatati, yaviti, ajamnu, bagadnu. Not to say that on Rosh Hashanah. Because of the high level, we rise up to a different dimension that God wants and God would prepare what we're supposed to do all the time. But this level of tshuva. Like the Rambam writes in the book of uh, the laws of tshuva, Chapter 10, the end of the laws of tshuva, this, discuss, this topic of tshuva out of fear, out of what's in it for me, out of the personal, I don't want to suffer, I don't want to, so I'll do the mitzvot, I'll be religious, I'll do tshuva for the sake of what? Who are you worried about? Who are you concerned with? Yourself. Yourself. Path of the just also in chapter 19. Oveda he says, you're serving yourself. You believe. You believe there's a policeman watching you. The level of emunah, of faith, whatever, it's very nice. A person who just abandons everything, like I said, he, he doesn't care. He does whatever comes to him and he's moral, total depravity, whatever. But here, no. He knows there's a policeman that he would like to do bad things, maybe. But it's not worth it because I don't want to suffer. I don't want to get the pains that go with it. So... The doctor tells you eat healthy. I, I'd like to eat chocolate, but he tells you. So if you're, you don't understand that, you're hurting yourself, so it's not worth it. So you do what is, uh, so you believe in these instructions, you believe that there's a God, etc. But that's not the highest level. But the Rambam says in chapter 10, a person should not say, I will fulfill the mitzvot of the Torah and occupy myself in its wisdom, like study of Torah, in order to receive all the blessings which are contained within it, or in order to merit the life of the world to come. There are blessings, and there is a world to come, but where's your intention? Your focus is 
or shouldn't be, the Rambam says, not in order to get those blessings. There are blessings. But where are you at? That's what concerns you? Like I said, your private, selfish concerns? The Rambam says not to do so. Similarly, I will separate myself from all the sins, which the Torah warned against. Why? So I will be saved from all the curses that Torah obtained in the Torah, so that my soul will not be cut off from the life of the world to come, either this world or the next world. For the, either the blessing for doing the good or the, 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 the punishment for doing the bad. But what's in it, what's concerned, what you're worried about is yourself. It is not fitting to serve God in this manner. A person whose service is motivated by these factors is considered one who serves out of fear. What I called before, what I said, right? Chuva from Yir'ah. Or Ovein, like he's serving God out of Yir'ah. Out of fear. He is not on the level of the prophets or of the wise. One who serves God out of love occupies himself in the Torah and the mitzvot and walks in the paths of wisdom. Why? For no ulterior motive. Not because of fear that evil will occur, nor in order to require benefit. Rather, he does what is true because it is true. Good for the sake of good. Not what I get out of it. And if I could get away with it, I would rather do something else. I'd be bad and, and, and just fill myself with gluttony and whatever. And, and, but it's not worth it. It doesn't pay, so to speak. But no, doing good for the sake of good. I want to do good. I want to better the world. It might be difficult even. It's not that I'll get good out of it. To sacrifice, yes, to sacrifice, to dedicate yourself for ideals. An idealist, like I said before. Altruist. He wants to help others. Ah, what if you get nothing out of it? They're not going to pay you for it. They'll call you a friar, right? You do something good, you do a favor, the Hebrew friar, right? What are you, it's a, uh, wasting your time helping, giving others? What do you get out of it? We're not supposed to be concerned with what, is, what I got out of it. You do truth for the sake of truth. And ultimately, good will come because of it. Again, there is a reward. But the question is, what's your intention? For the reward? Or that's not my focus. Like we said, the Vilna Gon, like the, the focus of all the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, not only the Vilna Gon, but others that write that, how all the prayers you see are just for the name of God, the kingdom of God, and through the Jewish people, the land of Israel. Why? Again, all that is because that's how God's name is revealed. You see the Ramchal of Moshe Chaim Lutzato as an amazing... Um, explanations of the prayers of Rosh Hashanah. And is, he has an article called uh, Mamara Chochmah, the, uh, the article of wisdom. I think probably translated it. Everything's in English almost today. You can look it up. Rav Chaim, Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramchal, if it's in English, Mamara Chochmah, the article, the essay on wisdom. And there he has the explanation of the prayers of Rosh Hashanah. And you see there how this connection to, to connect all the world uh, to God's good, again, for the sake of, for the good for the world, and how the connection to Am Yisrael brings that about, that the holiness that they revealed through the nation of Israel, that's how the world can be fixed, through the koach, the power of Torah that God gave to the nation of Israel. That's the real way to fix the world. Other ways are, to make the world better, so to speak, within the framework, less wars and less problems, and try to, the UN, they try to different isms in the world to try to, but what can actually fix the world and raise the world beyond the the state of what it's in today, this fallen state, to bring it to the kingdom of God, that God gave the Torah to the nation of Israel in order to connect the world to, to something much greater. And therefore the nations, when they connect to Am Yisrael, are able to link up to that holiness, to that goodness, to that fixing of all of creation. And not so when they're disconnected, not so when they, the opposite, when they work for the demise of the Jewish people. They're not only doing bad to us, it's not nice to her suffer, make the Jews suffer. They're not, what they're doing to themselves they're preventing themselves, withholding themselves, that blessing that comes through this conduit, through the heart of the nations that comes to all. But he talks about that. That's the motivation there for all the prayers. So the Rambam, going back to the Rambam, you do what is true because it's true, and ultimately good will come because of it. This is a very high level, which is not merited by every wise man. But I said before, it's not like it's everyone, this is the minimum, this is the... Be it's not so simple to get here. It's not the everyday level. I said on Rosh Hashanah, we're given a gift. God gives you these two days of preparation uh, the, uh, that enables you, that it facilitates this whole rising, putting your focus on who we really are, what we're, what we're supposed to be, where we, what our neshama, where we're, our neshama is called from this absolute dimension of the absolute good. It's not from this world. Our bodies, so to speak, are from here, the physical. We have a neshama, our inner source, our inner content, our essence is not from this world and wants to return to that, bring the world to that. It's sent down to this world in order to raise this world beyond this world. 
And that's what its focus is on, what you're concerned with. But it's not so simple. Not every, not every wise man gets to this level. It's the level of our patriarchs, Avram Avinu, that God described as he who loved me. For his service was only motivated by love. But God commanded us to seek this rung of service. As conveyed by Moshe, love God, your Lord. When a man will love God in the proper manner, he will immediately perform all of the mitzvot motivated by love, not by, again, what's in it for me. He describes the Lord as that love is a constant obsession, like a man loves a woman, it's constantly thinking about, worried about, concerned with, it's not just a side thing. So I love God. It's, it's, it's a life level. That's where you're at. That's where your concerns are. That's what you're focused on. And the rabbis were where, in other words, so to speak, understood these stages of getting there. One should say, I will study Torah in order that I become well. No, wait. Should one say, I will study Torah in order that I become wealthy, in order that I become a rabbi, or in order that I receive a world in the world to come? The Torah teaches us, if you are careful to observe my commandments, to love God, implying that you should, all you should do should only be done out of love. The sages also said, desire his commandments greatly. Desire his commandments and not the reward. Right? It says, in your commandments, I love the mitzvot, I love the connection to you, and not for the reward I get from them. However, I want to say before, I think he brings down later. So maybe we'll get to that in one. I'll just get it in the order here. Anyone who occupies himself with the Torah in order to receive reward or in order to protect himself from retribution is considered as one who is not occupied for, the, for God's sake. Loli Shema. Because again, What's in it for you? What's your word about yourself? In contrast, anyone who occupies himself with it, not because of fear nor to receive a reward, but rather because of his love for the Lord of the entire earth who commanded it. In other words, and you also worried about his name and his, what he wants. He wishes to have life and he wishes, he wants you to be healthy. So I want it like we said before. I asked to be healthy. Why? Because you want me to be healthy. You want to manifest your name in through human healthy, a nation of Israel and the world being healthy and complete. You want to bestow good. But my intention is not what was in it for me, but for your ideal. Nevertheless, our de- even though it's a high level, our rabbis declared a person should always occupy himself with the Torah even when it is not for God's sake, loli shema, for out of service, which is not for intended for God's sake, you will come to service in, for God's sake. In other words, loli shema, bali shema, the rabbi is saying, if you place in the Gemara. You serve in, in, originally, at the beginning, uh, initially, not for the sake of God, not for the ideal. You're not there yet. But you start doing it that way and ultimately you'll come to the level of doing it for God's sake, Lishma. Therefore, when one teaches children, etc., you should teach them out of fear in order to receive a reward. And as their knowledge grows and their wisdom increases, right? A child, you can't tell them this ideological, very idyllic, uh, for just self-sacrifice for the all. He's very much developing himself, and that's how it's supposed to be. The child is focused on the physical from the beginning, then the stages of the midot, the traits, but all the focus on the, the private. And then he starts feeling that there's other people in the world, there's other people that can concern with them, and gets higher and higher, as supposed to. As the wisdom grows, you receive, you reveal, the secret should be revealed to them slowly, bit by bit. The Ramah has in the, also in the uh, uh, introduction, he also talks about how the children tell them to teach them, so to speak, to train them to get to this level. First you tell them to learn Torah, you'll get a chocolate bar. Do your homework, you get a reward. What's important to him? What he sees as important is the chocolate bar. I'll do the homework. I'll, do, I'll learn Torah in order to get what's important. So if I have to pay, they swallow the, what the pill to get that's the price. But what's important to him is that. Later he gets more sophisticated. Chocolate isn't the end of the world. So it's uh, money for most of the world, right? He gets a level of money. So do this and you'll get money. You'll be rewarded. Over and over and again, there's an ulterior motive, so to speak, but it gets more sophisticated. More than it's not money isn't the end. Ultimately, honor. They'll call me a rabbi. You'll be a scholar. You'll be this. Or... Even that, all the honor in the world is, is nothing, is meaningless. He does it for, learn, do Torah, do the mitzvot for the sake of the world to come. Wow, very sophisticated. Even nothing of the pleasure of this world. He realizes that's empty and momentary and practical. Yeah, that's what's the word? Uh, transit, just but it's also transient. But it's for himself, no? Right. Even that, even what to come is for himself. And later, you're supposed to get to the level realizing that it's not for that. It's for the sake of the absolute good, the secret. She reveals them slowly, slowly. That you become accustomed to this concept, ultimately realize, sophisticated of understanding what's really important is not these reward, not this, but what's really important is the thing itself. For the goal, like he said before, doing the good for the sake of good, truth for the sake of truth, not for anything else. 
But there is a reward, there is good that will come out of it, even the physical, so to speak. But that's not the goal. Until they will grasp it and know it and begin to serve God out of love. Because he gets the only the love of God can only be an outgrowth of the knowledge which he knows him. It's a famous sentence of the Rambam. The knowledge of God, the word to learn. That's what we're studying. What do you mean? We talked about the beginning. The question was, why do you have to learn this big picture of the God? <laughs> what about look? You don't want to suffer? Do tshuva. If you did a sin, do this. Because it's much greater than that. The understanding the divine, the absolute goal, the bigger picture, what God has in store, the greatness of God, the, lung, the grandeur, etc. That's what it, then. That's the secret of the more. Then you can love God. Otherwise, God is just like this policeman that you wish you could run away from, but you can't escape. So. You believe that you can't escape. Uh, he's watching everywhere. So I'll subordinate, sub submit to him. That's not out of love. You can't love that. The most you can do is fear that policeman. But the love of God after the knowledge, what we discussed before, this bigger picture of why do we have to know that? Because that enables you. That's part of this knowledge of God. The greatness, the grandeur, the universal, the, the bigger the goal. But it's way beyond the, what you thought. That is part of the knowledge of God, the greatness of God. And then you, that's what's called getting to love him. A greater amount of knowledge arouses a greater love. Also, the Rambam, from Parshat Shavua, what we read, I don't have time, but we read there two days ago on Shabbat, Ki Tavo, mm. that the guy comes, the person comes with his first fruits, he comes to the enemy, he gives this long speech, what, thank God for this fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's worth, if I, I don't know, $50, $50, wow, there's new fruit, whatever. No. This long speech of the history of the Jewish people from Yaakov Avinu. And the, we, the uh, Lavan wanted to destroy the Jewish people and you saved us from that. And we went to Egypt and the slavery and the persecution and you saved us from that. And you brought us and you brought us to the land of go, uh, milk and honey. And here I am at the end of all that, of thousands of years of history go, and now culminates in the fruit that I'm holding is a continuation, is the culmination, so to speak, of this bigger picture of the Jewish history of thousands of years. It's not the private fruit, how much it's worth and how much it weighs. Thank you for this nice little fruit. But thank you for all that you've done. Recognition, in other words, you come to Yerushalayim and you raise your, part of the fact that you come to Yerushalayim is to raise your perspective beyond the moment, beyond the, again, the local private fruit and your private concerns, but part of, with the Beit HaMikdash and with all that's going on, the, you, in this historical uh, overview of all of history you see that comes down to this fruit and me and my fruit, but my, the perspective. So the same thing we're talking about here, this understanding how you're part of something so much bigger. It's not you and your tshuva. We mentioned the third level of tshuva. You did a sin, you fix your sin. That's it. It's part of, you're part of something so enormous, so great. That brings the simcha, right? The rest of the verse there in the kitavo. And then the samachta, but then you'll be happy. Because the whole generation is not so happy. We have all the depression, all these whatever people. They have so much. What are they missing? The physical blessing and then what's it called? Prosperity. Why is the generation so um, depressed and so much? Because they're looking for more, they're ready for more. The joy comes out of the proper understanding of where you are, what the understanding, the outlook on reality, not the situation, the external conditions. A person could have a lot of be not satisfied. A person could have what seems to be not a lot of not riches, and he's totally happy. So it's not just external conditions, how you look at the condition, how you look at the world. When you get to this level, you go to the Beit HaMikdash, and you come with the, this perspective, uh, then in the history, how you then you come to appreciate, and you then basamachta, then you come to this uh, the true joy. One during the Rambam, also the on this week's parasha, what we read at the, again last week, you know, what we read two days ago on Shabbat Kitavo, all the curses in this chapter. I said, why do they come about? You didn't worship God with joy. I'll just take one more minute of your time. Uh, the end of the laws of Sukkah. Lulav and Sukkah, the Rambam writes, it is a mitzvah to, so this is talking about the Simchat Beit Shoiva, the Beit HaMikdash, the holiday and the holiday of Sukkot, to joy, the extra joy. It's a mitzvah to add, to uh, elaborate, to, to enhance this uh, joy. Not that the simple people didn't do it, the rabbis, the scholars, the Sanhedrin, the, the giants of Torah used to dance and sing. Uh, for this, now he says in general, the Simcha, this is chapter, the end of Lulav, the joy that a person should do, have, when doing the mitzvot and the love that God, of God, that God commanded, is a great service. Avodah Dola. Great may be the value, but also great meaning it's difficult. No, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a real work. It's an effort. And everyone who prevents himself or restrain or refrains from this joy 
is worthy of, um, of punishment. For it says, what we read in Kitavo, Shabbat, that that you didn't serve God with sim- not that you didn't work to serve God. The punishment well, because you didn't serve God. No, you served God. But you didn't serve God with simcha, with a good heart. You were doing it like again out of I have to, I'm forced. As the rabbis write, the Magid Mishnah, the commentary on the Rambam here says, the main principle, the, the big principle that Rambam is saying here, that it's not worthy to serve God, to, serve, to do the mitzvot, mitzat shem chovalav, that's an obligation. You're forced, you're coerced to do them. What can I do? There's no way out. That's the performance, that's the, how you identify with the grandeur, the gift that God gave us to perform it, to connect us and the world. To, you did, now I have to, I can't get out of it, I can't run away. Force, coercion. But I have to do it, no worry. But rather you should do it out of the joy in doing them. And you do it with the do good because of it's good. Choose truth because of the truth. What the Rambam says here is in the Hilchot Shuva. Do the, the truth for the, because of the sake of the truth. Doing good for the sake of good. Not for what I get out of it. Not what's in it for me. For good to, to, I want it to bestow good. I want to be connect to Hashem, which means to bring good to the world. God wishes the absolute good. Tov Hashem Lakol, we say in Ashrei, three times a day. And also to participate, to emulate God, to be good. That's what Anishama wishes. To, do, to, to bestow good, to bring good to the world. Beyond the personal concern. But at the end, there is good. There is a reward. It's not like you do good and you'll be punished. And you'll be suffered. But even at the sake of, yes, of sacrificing to help others, to give others. As you know, the, if a soldier in Israel is willing to give his life for the, this ideal, even if he's not aware of the, the bigger picture consciously. But the neshama wishes to, to do, uh, to help others, to give. We don't realize that the, this level. And that's the level we're supposed to be on. And that's the, the punishment of not to be there. It's a very severe thing, as we said. So to end up in the positive thing that we use these two days of Rosh Hashanah to this gift, this opportunity to, that God gives us to grow, to elevate, to rise up to our perspective and our life level, to be where we're supposed to be, where we really are, where neshama is, to be normal. And then you have the joy, then you have the simcha. Because you're yourself, you're normal. Not to be so, to be selfish and private is not, you won't be happy in that because it's not yourself. That's not the real self. You're confining, constricting yourself. It's not just not a religious duty to be altruistic. That's your real self. And to not do so is not to be happy. That's why the frustration and all the angst and all the different things of this generation, because we're ready for now, prepared to be on this fault in the time of the generation, to be on this level, and the Shema guides our lives, to be where we're at. And that's what Rosh Hashanah, we should utilize the prayers and the mitzvah, the, the, everything that we do on the Rosh Hashanah, these two days to rise up to this level and then uh, to be fulfilled this level of serving God on the proper level to bring good to us and to the world as Hashem.